I believe everybody needs a mission. Everybody needs to find out what they are compelled to do, and they need to do it 100% without reservation or hesitation. This is the foundation of every great business, every great career. I also believe that you have to trust your people and give them as much freedom as possible. This is the secret to unleashing their potential. And that was the culture we created at The Onion. And so you could go into the office any time, day or night, and you could find writers cranking away on stories, just trying to make them as, as good as they possibly could. One of those early writers was a guy named Rich. He worked as a school bus driver during the day and came to work at The Onion all night. I, I don't know when he slept. He was the hardest working guy I've, I've ever encountered. And a lot of times in those early years, it was just me and Rich staying up late, drinking Cokes, eating pizzas, trying to make each other laugh, trying to make each issue of The Onion funnier than the last. It was crazy times, and nobody was making money. We were barely covering expenses. Some of our advertisers paid in cash, which seemed strange at the time, and then years later, apparently one of them had been busted for cocaine laundering. So, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Another early writer I want to tell you about is Carol. I discovered Carol through her street art. She would do these crazy stunts in town, and you couldn't help but notice them. One of them was, whenever she would go on vacation, she would steal a roll of toilet paper from the public restroom there, label where she got it from, and then display it in her apartment. <laughs> and then other people did the same thing. They heard about it, and they'd, they'd go somewhere, and they'd send her toilet paper, and so she had, you know, Mount Rushmore, Graceland, or whatever, but then when other people started hearing about it, she had the Louvre, she had the Great Wall of China, she had the White House. And <laughs> the White House toilet paper was encased in a special glass, you know, box. <laughs> and she called it the Toilet Paper Museum and she would give you a tour, like a docent, if you went to her house. <laughs> Another thing she did was she dug a hole in the grassy median in front of her apartment, about this deep, this wide, with a, a little placard sign next to it that said, Who took our baby? <laughs> and you're walking down the street and you just, you can't help but you read the rest of the text there and it explained how their precious baby had died and they buried her here in the grassy median and some monster had dug her up. <laughs> Please bring her back. <laughs> so, with writers like these, <laughs> the onion started to get into a little bit of trouble for some of the things that we were printing. <laughs> we got into trouble early on from the governor of Wisconsin. We were planning a big front page story. Governor proclaims November masturbation month. <laughs> and I needed a photo of the governor to go with the story. <laughs> so I called his office and talked to his press secretary, a guy by the name of John Hankus, who said, The Onion, huh? I've seen you around. No, no, I'm not going to give you a photo. So I just went to the local daily newspaper. They had a whole file of photos of the governor. They had a great photo of him at a podium doing this, perfect for the story. <laughs> And just for kicks, as I was laying that out, I decided in really small type next to that photo, I'd put, special thanks to John Hankus. <laughs> and so when that issue hit the streets, we got a really angry phone call from John Hankus. <laughs> and it still delights me to imagine him getting bawled out by the governor. But he demanded a retraction and said he was going to sue us and all this. So in the next issue of The Onion on the inside cover, we put a little box that said, Last week, The Onion erroneously reported that the governor had proclaimed November Masturbation Month. Uh, it was a reporter's mistake. Uh, <laughs> he had actually named it Sodomy Month. Uh, the Onion regrets the error. And special thanks to John Hankus for this clarification. <laughs> our troubles did not end there. We got a knock on our door from this very serious-looking attorney in a suit and graying temples who said, I understand you've reproduced a photograph of my client, Ginger Rogers, without her express written permission. I'm here to find evidence of that infringement and use it in a court of law when I sue you out of existence. And he barges in and starts rifling through our back issues. And meanwhile, my knees are buckling because I know what he's talking about. We totally ran this photo of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers dancing in, in the worst possible way. We put it in a, a, an ad for a hamburger place that we had made. And you can't do that. If you use a celebrity's photo in an advertisement, it implies endorsement, and you lose that case. It's open shut. So I'm thinking, all right, well, this onion thing was fun while it lasted. And he gets up from the back issue pile and says, well, you know, I had it on good authority to run that photo, but you know what? I can't find it. And I'm glad, because I think what you kids are doing is hilarious. 
Oh, that thing with the governor. <laughs> and this attorney, whose name is Ken, Ken Artis, perhaps out of guilt, decides from that moment forward that he's going to be the Onion's pro bono legal counsel. <laughs> he's going to review every issue of The Onion before it goes to press to make sure there's nothing actionable, and he's going to defend us if anyone like him ever comes after us trying to sue us out of existence. And we used him a lot. <laughs> now, despite some of these setbacks, The Onion's starting to grow a little bit. We're starting to get a little bit of attention. And the crazy thing is, the attention that we're getting is when we get in trouble, when we're outrageous. I want to tell you about this other writer named Ben who had taken a marketing class. He was a different kind of writer. He came from the business side of the company, but he really wanted to write jokes, so he would come hang out with the comedy writers, and they didn't like this at all. Like, who's this business guy hanging out in our meetings? And, he, you know, he, he was well-dressed, he was well-spoken, he was clean, he was emotionally stable. He didn't fit in at all. <laughs> But he had this idea that we should be sending out press releases. We should be doing marketing. We had never spent a penny on marketing. We didn't know. Who would have thought? And so he would start sending out press releases when The Onion would come out with a new issue or whatever, and we got no coverage. Nobody cared about our press releases. And that's when it hit me. We shouldn't be sending out press releases. We should be doing things that are press-worthy. So we just kept being outrageous, and we kept doing crazier and crazier things. Or we would expand into new areas, like do a book and try to make it even better than, you know, the paper that people really liked, or we would do a TV show, or anything that would get attention. When the mid-2000s hit, the bandwidth was such that you could start putting videos online. So we started doing web videos, and that was an opportunity for us to really leverage this outrageous marketing strategy, and we made videos that were crazy. Some of them were too hot for the internet. We, had, we literally couldn't, couldn't post them, or we'd get shut down. But some of them, the ones that got out, were still pretty controversial. We put out a video that was a parody of a morning show. It was called Today Now. And there was a report about, again, we're making fun of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. We can't leave them alone. The Make-A-Wish Foundation was going bankrupt because a kid had wished for unlimited wishes. and he had them bringing in battleships and F-18 hornets and all these baseball celebrities, and they, they had to d deliver on the, the promise. And so they, his, his lawyer, or, or the lawyer for the Make-A-Wish Foundation, was on the show talking about how they're you know, doing everything they, they can, but we hired this expensive legal team, and the kid wished them away, so there's really nothing we can do. <laughs> And I got a really angry phone call from the head of the Make-A-Wish Foundation saying that funders were calling them, wondering if they were going bankrupt. Uh, <laughs> they had to put a big message on their front page of their website saying, no, the Make-A-Wish Foundation does not give away unlimited wishes. <laughs> the onion is satire and all this other stuff. And what started happening then was more of the same. We leveraged our outrageousness, and we heightened the contrast, and we played it to the hilt. And what started happening was a new kind of anger. It wasn't people getting upset that they were being made fun of, necessarily. It was people getting upset because they were confused into thinking that The Onion was real news. So this was happening more and more, and, and when people who should know better were taking The Onion seriously, that's when we would get a lot of attention. The nation of China. <laughs> we fooled them a lot. <laughs> Maybe it's a cultural thing, I don't know. We did a story about how the U.S. Congress was threatening to leave Washington unless the city built them a new Capitol building with a retractable dome and stadium seating and all this stuff. <laughs> you know, maybe they go somewhere where they're treated better, like Omaha. <laughs> and the largest circulation newspaper at the time, the Beijing Evening News, reprinted that story verbatim. <laughs> and we had made this elaborate Adobe Illustrator graphic with the, showing the retraction and the hot dog stands and everything. They printed that, too. <laughs> a couple years ago, The Onion named Korean dictator Kim Jong-un the world's sexiest man alive. <laughs> the official Chinese news agency reprinted that story verbatim. <laughs> they even added some of their own fo sexy photos of the dictator, you know, to augment the, the story. And the great thing is, when they realize they've been had, 
They get very confused. I remember after the Capitol Dome story ran, they, they ran a little correction box in the, in the next issue that simply said, apparently, there are newspapers in America that print lies. 